Okay, welcome everybody to our final session of the day, where we get to continue learning about the exciting updates in education, outreach, and community science. Em will be our moderator for the session again, so Em, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks so much, Maddie. Um, before we begin with uh, part two of this session, um, I just wanted to highlight the Invasive Species Center Awards. Uh, these are given annually to recognize and celebrate the leadership and commitment of individuals or organizations who help keep land and water in Canada free from invasive species. Um, and so you'll want to tune in uh, this Thursday at 845 in the morning to celebrate this year's nominees and winners. Um, but for now, we have a couple of great speakers um, coming up. Uh, and so we have a presentation co-delivered by uh, John Barker from BioForest and Curtis Marcou from the town of Oakville. Um, feel free to take it away. Thanks very much, Emily. That showing up okay? Yep, looks great. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to be talking today about the Forest Health Ambassador Program, a volunteer program on street tree monitoring in the town of Oakville, Ontario. So anyone who's unfamiliar with the area, it's about two towns west of Toronto, and it's a community of about 210,000 people. We're just going to go over the background of the program, the history and its goals, and then get into some of the details, uh, the stats and results we've collected over the years, the feedback from participants and how the program has evolved. And then Curtis will give us uh, the town of Oakville's perspective on the program. And then we'll just wrap up with conclusions. So the Forest Health Ambassador Program it exists within the framework of a comprehensive urban forest health monitoring program. Uh, it was created by the town of Oakville and it was uh, it, with support from BioForest. Uh, it's been running annually since 2014 and BioForest has been the consultant for the program for that time. The aim of the program is to expand early detection capabilities and monitor the health of Oakville's urban forest over time with three areas of focus. And so those are pest detection surveys of all the public woodlands in Oakville, uh, fixed long-term forest health monitoring plots in a sample of those woodlands, and a volunteer program, which is our forest health ambassador program. So there's three primary objectives to the program, community awareness and education, early detection of invasive pests, and tracking forest health trends over time. So that first objective is the cornerstone of the program, generating awareness and educating members of the public on tree health, urban forestry, and invasive insects is key to the success of the program and just for overall forest management in the town. Um, it also allows volunteers to take on a meaningful role in urban forest uh, conservation in their community. The first objective also feeds directly into the second, uh, as informed volunteers are better able to detect and report invasive pests early. And that early detection is key for rapid response and effective management of invasive pests. And then the third objective is accomplished as volunteers survey annually, and that data accumulates and provides insights into forest health trends. So the program has a cohesive structure, but the format is flexible. So it can be adapted to changing concerns about certain invasive pests. The program focuses on monitoring street trees, which are accessible to volunteers in the neighborhoods where they live. So volunteers, when they sign up, are assigned an area based on their address, uh, and they assess the street trees in their survey area for several criteria of stem and crown health and for the presence of three invasive insects that are of high concern to the town of Oakville, emerald ash borer, spongy moth, and Asian longhorn beetle. So BioForest holds a training session in the spring and volunteers are supplied with custom data sheets and maps of their survey area. So they complete their assessments at their own pace through the summer and then submit their data at the end of the summer. And BioForest also audits the volunteer submissions as they come in to make sure that the data we're receiving is accurate. 
and then we compile and analyze the results and produce a report on the program, uh, which is available for public reading. So some stats from the program. The graph on the top shows uh, the number of volunteers who are trained and the number who submit their data each year. And then the table on the bottom shows a bit more detail about each year's uh, submissions. And you'll notice that 2020 is missing also because of the COVID hiatus. Um, so since 2014, the program has seen pretty significant growth. Uh, the participation surged in 2019 and hit an all-time high in 2021. And 2019 was also the year with the largest number of volunteers submitting data. The sudden growth of that program we attribute mainly to an influx of high school students who joined to complete their mandatory 40 hours of uh, community volunteer work for school. Um, but those high school students have continued to be a large component of each year's volunteer base. Um, and the number of uh, trees surveyed by volunteer can vary quite a bit depending on how many trees are in a certain survey area, but also how active each volunteer is, since they can survey as much as they like. Um, but the past two years have seen the highest rates of trees surveyed per volunteer. Um, and even though we've, we had a bit of a drop off in 2023 compared to the previous couple of years, we're still seeing very high rates, high numbers of uh, trees surveyed by volunteers. So this map just illustrates all of the trees that have been assessed by volunteers throughout the program since 2014 and their distribution. And uh, there are some gaps in it, but note that there, this big uh, empty space in the west end of town, there's a provincial park here and, and a big industrial area. So there's not really, that's not really open to surveying. Um, there's some other industrial areas where also there's not really any street trees to survey. Uh, to date, the volunteers have surveyed and submitted results for 18,994 trees, and the pest detections that they routinely uh, report are emerald ash borer and spongy moth. Um, occasionally, a volunteer will report a suspected detection of Asian longhorn beetle, which the bioforest staff then go and investigate in person, um, but none of those have ever been positive for ALHB. They tend to be either woodpecker damage or due to some other insect activity, uh, but the reports are very valuable. Um, it's good to have those eyes out there looking for those kinds of signs. The spongy moth reports have also been valuable in keeping uh, track of the distribution of the pest, and especially in the years leading up to the surge we saw in 2020. Uh, and those surveys help to influence the scope of the formal spongy moth monitoring surveys that take place in the fall. Uh, in addition to those top three pests, the volunteers can also report detections of European elm scale and cankerworm, uh, two other pests that are on the town's radar. And uh, one volunteer actually did detect European elm scale in 2017. Some of the other results uh, indicate that Norway maple is a dominant species in the town's street tree population, uh, with honey locusts and eastern white cedar being also very common. And the vast majority of trees assessed by volunteers are healthy, uh, in good condition, with few or no uh, issues to report in the stem or crown. <clears throat> We also collect feedback from the participants each year to uh, just make sure that the program is meeting their needs and to get a sense of what aspects of the program are enjoyable and where we can improve. So uh, we've learned that volunteers come to the program through a variety of means. So it, it's important to have a diversity of strategies for outreach and uh, advertising. And we get many new volunteers each year, but a sizable portion of the volunteer base still consists of returning volunteers, some of whom have been in the program since the very beginning. Um, volunteers also commonly cite an interest in urban forestry as a reason they join, and also a desire to earn those high school volunteer hours. The feedback consistently praises the training and the quality of the survey materials that we give to the volunteers. Um, also the ability to contribute to local urban forest management and also being able to connect with neighbors while being active outdoors. 
some of the drawbacks we've heard include volunteers sometimes having issues with reading their maps or data sheets. Sometimes the addresses can be a little confusing. So we work with those volunteers on a case by case basis to solve those map issues. So the program has evolved over the years to try to increase recruitment and make surveying easier for volunteers and adapt to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and all the challenges there, and also to broaden the scope of education materials. We've seen that youth have been a primary driver of the increase in recruitment of the program, and that's largely due to actually uh, directly reaching out to schools. Um, early in the program's history, we updated the format of the data sheets and survey methods to be more user friendly based on feedback that we'd gotten from the volunteers. Um, now, following the COVID imposed hiatus of 2020, the program shifted to a digital platform in 2021. So we used to do in-person training sessions. Now we do them over Teams. And that's actually allowed us much greater flexibility um, because the training can be held at a specific time. And anyone who is unable to attend then can just view the recording and still participate in the program. The delivery of the survey materials also shifted to online. So uh, rather than having paper map packages that need to be delivered, we can just email them out. So it's much more efficient that way and it's easier to receive uh, submissions from the volunteers. Also the past few years, we've seen a growing list of invasive insect and disease pests uh, threaten Oakville's urban forests. Urban forest. So as a result, we've included oak wilt, uh, spotted lanternfly and hemlock woolly adelgid in the training materials. Um, even though none of those pests have been confirmed in Oakville, there's there still a possibility they could arrive. So we want the volunteers to be educated and prepared uh, for how to identify and report them. And that just helps support the early detection capabilities. Okay, so just to uh, jump in and give a bit of the uh, municipal, I guess, perspective on a program such as this. Um, within the forestry department, one of the, the biggest management challenges I face is, is reactive calls for native um, and non-native pest and diseases and hazards and storm response that we get uh, often through the middle of the night for blocked roads. Um, so one of the options or I guess nice things about a program like this is to really be proactive in dealing with the public to really educate them ahead of these issues or common uh, requests that we get. So that way we can help them when they're calling in and giving us descriptions of, of issues or concerns that they might have. They, they can use language that really appropriately describes the issue that they're navigating. Um, oops, sorry. So uh, in, in the larger context for us too, the value of the program is for that, that early detection, like John was saying, the, the residents and forest health ambassadors that are involved in this program really are eyes and ears on the ground. Um, they're able to cover and look at a significantly more trees than I am with my internal staff. Um, and they're critical to that early detection uh, portion of our program. Um, I say we often joke with each one of them that there are eyes and ears or an extension of our department um, and they can really give us that feedback uh, really to help mitigate any sort of total damage or control with something newly found. Um, it really lets us get time for a rapid assessment or rapid response if necessary, depending on what the issue is. Um, and also the program primarily is a large communication tool. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of our our only touch point with residents is when they have a complaint, they have a concern, or they're dealing with something that's hazardous to, to the roadway or their home, um, or something that's a, an extreme nuisance to them. Um, so an engagement program like this really helps us proactively educate them, um, give them a firm understanding why we're taking uh, undertaking certain programs or why we need to be decisive on certain issues or move very quickly. Um, as we've seen the public develop better understanding of these issues, navigating more complex projects becomes easier, uh, much like the aerial spray that we undertook uh, the last few years. Um, and then one of the large things we also see is the influence on private property. Our canopy target is 40% and private property canopy cover is critical in achieving that. The Forest Health ambassadors take what they learn and, and what our programs are for municipal trees, and they often are, are 
often inquiring about um, expanding, um, developing, and incorporating more canopy on their private pro property, uh, which contributes to the town as a whole. So it's a, a key uh, proactive program that we we have here at the town, and we really appreciate the education it provides our residents. So I'll kick it back to John for a bit of a conclusion. Great. So just to wrap up, um, the Forest Health Ambassador Program promotes awareness of urban forestry issues among members of the public. Uh, it involves having an enhanced capacity for early detection of invasive insect and disease pests and provides a unique and important insights into street tree health trends. Um, it's also a very valuable education tool for the town and positively and positively influences private tree management by bridging the connection between residents and the forestry department. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. We'll take any questions you have. And I think they're going to put our emails in the chat if anyone wants to follow up with us. Yes. Um, thank you both so much for uh, kicking off uh, the after the late afternoon session, I should say. Um, we do have five minutes for questions. Um, I'll start with the one we have in the Q&A right now. But if anyone has any more, um, please pop them in the Q&A. We do have some time. Um, so first question we have is the bioforest uh, scope of work on forestry management limited to urban forests only? Uh, in terms of our general scope of work, we mainly work in urban areas. Uh, we have worked in some uh, kind of peri-urban areas, arguably, like we've worked with cottage associations in the past. Um, a lot of work that we do is with municipalities, though. Um, so mostly urban, but not entirely. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Um, so maybe we'll just uh, keep things moving. Um, okay, thank you again both so much. And we'll pop your emails into the chat just in case anyone wanted to follow up. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Rachel Ahriejugla, and she is coming to us from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Emily. Thank you for this. I'll try to share my screen. Please let me know if it works. Yep. Does it work? Looks great. Awesome. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, so uh, as Emily mentioned, my name is Rachel. I work at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, I know this session looks a little bit more at education and outreach, and this one is a little bit more sort of how do things happen internationally going into that into the domestic uh, realm of uh, of things. Um, so in terms of the my presentation overview, I'll talk a little bit about some of the key international agreements and highlights that happened in the last a year and a few months, and uh, then look at uh, providing an update on the development of Canada's 2030 National Biodiversity Strategy. And then uh, the last point would be like, how does ECCC try to enable actions on invasive alien species um, through work on um, this strategy? Um, but first, First, I'd like to um, acknowledge, so I live in, in Getsno, uh, and so just acknowledge that I live on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people uh, who have been taking care of this land and the Ottawa River and its tributaries for time immemorial. Uh, and it's definitely a key part, the Ottawa River is definitely a key part of uh, living in the Ottawa Getsno region. Um, so to start, uh, so going back to uh, December 2022, um, so there was the adoption of the Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, so it was uh, this big, um, what they call now the biodiversity plan, which included four global goals to 2050 and 23 global targets to 2023. Uh, some of them are more well-known than others. <laughs> for example, one uh, would be, for example, the protecting 30% uh, of um, areas by 2030, halting and reversing biodiversity loss. Um, and also it includes one on invasive alien species, which I will get to in uh, just a couple seconds. Um, but there were also other decisions that were made uh, uh, 
on that were more technical um, during uh, COP15, as we call it, uh, which includes, for example, the adoption of the monitoring framework, which provides indicators for each of the um, international global targets to try to measure progress against them. So target six uh, really is the target that focuses on invasive alien species. Uh, the target itself, as you can try to read it on the slide, is a bit of a mouthful. So overall, uh, what I'll let you know is that there's five main elements to the target. So one is to eliminate, minimize, mitigate the impacts of invasive alien species on biodiversity and ecosystem services. The second is to manage pathways for the introduction of alien species, then preventing the introduction and establishment of both priority and other invasive alien species, um, then and uh, then eradicating uh, or controlling invasive alien species with a focus on priority sites. So we have to think this is global. Um, and there's a global indicator as well that was um, that was approved, which is the rate of invasive alien species establishment. And then Canada adopted uh, those global targets and is basically translating them uh, at the domestic level, level, but taking them as is. So it is a fairly ambitious uh, target and an indicator that could be um, a bit challenging to. Uh, to to measure, but this is what we have uh, set ourselves up for to the challenge. Uh, another fairly important um, uh, international highlight that took place is the release of the thematic assessment report on invasive alien species and their control. Uh, it was done under uh, IPBES, so the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, which provides a lot of scientific evidence to help support work that is undertaken under the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so the summary for policymakers uh, was approved and then the thematic assessment, the whole report was accepted in September 2023 at IBES 10. And it's really the first comprehensive global assessment of invasive alien species, which is why it's so important. Um, and it uh, assesses the current status and trends of invasive alien species, such as their impacts, the direct and indirect drivers that have an impact on um, how invasive alien species um, might behave or how, if there would be more of them, as well as management and also policy options to address this key threat to biodiversity. And uh, you can see there's the website where you can have uh, the summary for policymakers as well as the full report is also available. Um, I'll note, I'll also share that uh, the work was led by three uh, three co-chairs, including one that is Canadian, Dr. Peter Stote, and he is also uh, going to be the keynote speaker uh, on February 15th at 1230. So I highly encourage you to take part in this. You'll have uh, a lot more information on, on this thematic assessment and why it's so, it's so important, basically. Uh, but I'll give you a little... Um, a little sneak peek into it, <laughs> um, which is uh, the figure that you see here is the figure of the summary uh, for policymaker, the first figure of it. And it's key, it really sh shows a big summary of, you know, what is important. It provides definition on the process of biological invasions, the various steps of the biological invasion process. And it also provides definition of invasive alien species. So now all the countries in the world have the same definition, the same understanding, which really helps to continue having those discussions and trying to find what actions are needed to, uh, to be able to address uh, the threats of the invasions and also of invasive alien species. Another international highlight is um, the G7 statement on invasive alien species. Um, so the G7 focuses on a number of topics. Um, but Japan, during their presidency, which ended at the beginning of this year, uh, really put the focus on invasive alien species. They really take this issue seriously. Um, and they had events organized throughout the year on uh, invasive alien species. And in November 2023, they had a workshop um, and they where we were able to finalize um, 
the G7 statement on invasive alien species. And it really centers around the efforts needed to achieve target six, what can each country of the G7 do, but also what other countries that are not members of the G7 could do if, um, if they wanted to help advance and achieve target six. And it also acknowledges the findings of the IPES thematic um, assessment report on invasive alien species and their control. So this, um, this statement really aimed at enabling action on the ground. So it doesn't say, um, it sort of repeats sort of the main best practices that, that need to happen. Uh, for example, it focuses on promoting global and regional and bilateral collaboration, um, also strengthening scientific research, global databases and information systems, um, and also outreach and mainstreaming through a whole of government, whole of society approach. So it really repeats a little bit of the important conclusions that came out of the IPBES report and also on capacity building, which is always needed. And I think we're having great uh, examples of this in this uh, in this panel. So now moving on, how do we take this important information that is uh, produced internationally or that our agreements that we agree to internationally and then translate it back to um, our national context. Uh, so you see a bit of a timeline. I won't go through the December one, we just went through it. But in May, 2023, so uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, we launched the, a discussion document and had an online survey that ran through the summer uh, to try to gauge the interest of um, people, the public organizations, what is important to them. Um, and then based on that information, uh, and based on the information that we had as part of our departments, we then looked, uh, we then launched a milestone or published a milestone document, uh, which was released for public comments in December. Um, and then this winter, what we're trying to do is continue sort of the public comment period just ended on Friday, but we continuing some targeted engagement. Then after that, in the winter and spring of 2024, we're hoping to finalize the strategy, looking at all the um, comments that are coming in, and then we would release it in advance of the next big meeting of the Convention on Biological Diversity, because this is a requirement for all the countries to have this document ready. Um, it has a more technical name. We call it the 2030 National Biodiversity Strategy, but all the countries will have to present it by October um, 2024. So a little bit about the milestone document uh, because it's the one that was the most uh, that is the most current and recent. Um, so it was publicly released on uh, in December. <clears throat> it talks about uh, each of the targets. It's still a fairly high level summary of, you know, why those targets are important, sort of ideas about what could be done, um, and then trying to get the reaction from people. As I mentioned, the public comment period just ended on Friday, and we've received 179 um, um, submissions for comments so far from a number of organizations, as well as um, some governments, uh, municipal governments, for example, and also sometimes individuals or academics as well. And so we're taking this and we're <laughs> right in the midst of going through the, all the information, uh, trying to make sure that, you know, that we are reflecting that information as well um, into the implementation plans that we're going to have for each of the targets. Um, and uh, so, the one that I focus on is target six. So we're still integrating all those comments and then a little bit more about the target six itself. Um, so what are we doing right now? So with that information, so for target six, what we call the implementation plan for it, um, it is code develop. Uh, we're working with it. So Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as um, the Par Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And we work with a lot of other departments to try to um, figure out what what are the best what is the best course of action that would help enable action on the ground um, that would have results on invasive alien species. Um, so we also recognize the important role that is played by all levels of governments as well as non-governmental players in achieving target six. And this is also reflected in some of the policy recommendations that were made at the international stage about really this need for um, 
for involving um, a lot of players in in order in a coordinated way, ideally, in order to um, to be able to uh, to address uh, this issue. Uh, we also have uh, fairly close discussions with jurisdictions in, involved through um, federal, provincial, and territorial territorial committees. Um, so this includes, for example, the Invasive Alien Species uh, National Committee, where we do talk about what actions um, what actions would be the most meaningful that can be done by the federal government, but also by prov provincial and territorial um, government to be able to, uh, to address um, the threat and be able to achieve target six. I think there's still uh, a lot of work to, to be done on this. And uh, and certainly we're we're hoping to be able to provide the necessary tools so that we can um, we can address this uh, this uh, this issue. And I believe this is my last slide. I do I think um, I do believe that people will have access to my slides. So that I did have a few slices and annex just to give a, a bit of information about the various targets or how the milestone document is uh, organized. Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions in the meantime if there is any. Thank you very much. Hey, um, yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. And um, if you did want to um, add, we just got a request for the links from your slides. Um, if you wanted to add those in the chat, maybe afterwards, um, that would be appreciated if you're able to do that. Um, we do just have one question in the Q&A for now, um, but uh, we do have uh, plenty of time. So if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A and I will read those aloud for Rachel. Um, so you refer to in, invasive alien species specifically. Um, so someone's just wondering what the what the difference is between invasive versus invasive alien. Why do we use that term? Yeah, and that, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> it's a and it's a tricky one. So it's we in the government of Canada and internationally, uh, the term that is used is invasive alien species, uh, but it really equates to invasive uh, invasive species. Um, I think across the rest of like provinces and territories, apart from Quebec and French, it does equate uh, espèce exotique envahissante. So it's it's more like exotic, uh, invasive exotic species. Um, but the way that it's done internationally is that when we're looking at invasive species, we're looking at the ones that cross the border of the country. So they're alien to the country. Whereas for example, for a province, they may look at an invasive species that crosses into the border of the province. Say if we're thinking mountain pine beetles coming from Alberta going to Ontario, it'll be considered a pest in Alberta. Um, it'll be considered an invasive species in, uh, in Ontario. But for the purpose of Canada, when we report internationally, it w the mountain pine beetle would not be considered an invasive alien species because it is native to Canada. So I think it's just sort of the scale. And there are some questions about whether it is the right term or not. Um, I also have the same questions, but it is the term that is being used uh, internationally on, uh, on this. But yes, thank you very much for this question. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's actually, that's very helpful to um, discuss. Um, okay, can I, someone's just asking about the additional slides. Can I clarify where you were going to share those? Um, if I send them to you, can they be available to people? Um, I'm not sure if we can share files in the chat. Okay. Um, our coordinators might be able to help with that. You did end two minutes early if you wanted to like share a slide or two, but we we just have like kind of a couple minutes left. I think maybe what I'll do is that I'll uh, if you uh, if you look for the milestone document and then you say milestone document biodiversity government of Canada, there are basically images that come from that. So they're like the first one is. Oh, and it says we can share in the lobby chat, so I can do that okay. too. Uh, but it's like basically sort of the short name of all the targets, how the milestone document is organized. They're available online, but since I can also share them in the lobby, I'll, I'll do that too. Sure, great. Yeah, please go ahead and do that. Thank you. Okay. Okay.
Um, well, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you again so much, Rachel, and we will move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, so next up, we have Susan Ellis uh, coming to us from the organization Friends of the Second Marsh. Welcome, Susan. Hello, thank you, Emily. I'm just going to share my screen here. Give me a second here. Okay, so are you seeing my slide? Yes, all looks good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Emily, for the introduction. Thank you for this opportunity as well. And welcome, everyone. Um, first, a little bit about the organization. Uh, Friends of Second Marsh is a registered charity located in Oshawa, Ontario. Our focus is protecting and preserving Oshawa Second Marsh and adjacent natural areas. Our programs support wetland education and environmental stewardship. These programs, in particular, plant stewardship, rely heavily on volunteers. Today, we are pleased to talk about one of our programs, Meaningful Plant Stewardship. Friends of Second Marsh acknowledges the lands and people of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. We are thankful to be welcomed on these lands covered under the Williams Treaties and the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the Greater Anishinaabeg Nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to a number of Indigenous nations and people. Friends of Second Marsh is still learning about its treaty obligations, the path to reconciliation, and how to care for the land. It is with heartfelt respect and gratitude that we talk today about the natural spaces we love. Oshawa Second Marsh is a 137 hectare coastal wetland on the north shore of Lake Ontario. Oshawa Second Marsh with the adjacent areas of McLaughlin Bay Wildlife Reserve and Darlington Provincial Park represent nearly 400 hectares of natural space and is one of the largest publicly accessible waterfronts in the greater Toronto area. In short, it is a hidden gem in an urban setting. Our plant stewardship program is certainly not the first, nor will it be the last human influence here. These areas have a long human history. Indigenous peoples refer to an area near Oshawa Second Marsh as the Scugog Carrying Place. It is the south end of the Scugog Carrying Place route from Lake Ontario to Lake Scugog and was used by the ancestral Wendat peoples. More recently, part of this area was a farm, then it was restored to a wildlife reserve. As such, Oshawa Second Marsh is designated and protected under the Ontario Heritage Act. The areas where we work are also important in rare natural spaces on the migration flyway for birds and insects, not to mention the many diverse species who live or visit there year round, humans included. Habitat types include marsh, swamp, wet meadow, beach, forest, upland meadow, and thickets. Oshawa Second Marsh is recognized and protected as an urban river valley within the Greenbelt, a provincially significant wetland, and together with McLaughlin Bay Wildlife Reserve, an area of natural and scientific interest. Admittedly, much of the area has lately been under pressure from human influence, like urban development and introduced species. Some influences were intentional and some not. Some introduced plant species are dominant, affecting biodiversity and the quality of important natural habitats. Friends of Second Marsh decided to re-examine its plant stewardship programming and started by thinking about the words we use, which led us to reflect on our heartfelt intentions, which led us to meaningful action. We looked at the words we used often around plant stewardship and then looked for alternative terms to better describe what we were trying to accomplish. After all, we were and are trying to make a positive impact on nature while creating a positive and fulfilling experience for our volunteers. For example, we avoid using the term invasive species. Instead, we might use dominant introduced species. We also avoid negative terms like eradicate. Instead, we most often use manage 
or refer to our work as making room for a rich biodiversity that supports the connected web of the ecosystem. This thoughtful review of the words we use drove us to look for at our attentions. Why were we doing the work and what key goals were important to keep the work impactful? We thought about the history of this land and what it had been through and what it might become. Then we pledged to create a respectful environment for nature in all its forms, including humans, combined with time to nurture connections with nature and each other, and above all, to minimize disruption to and improve the habitats we manage. To this end, we created the following protocol to create an adaptive management plan that minimizes disruption, values all, and enables learning. And at each stewardship activity, we began with a land acknowledgement and a thoughtful quote or idea to encourage reflection on our intentions. For example, we might begin by saying, we do only what we need to do, we take only what we need to take, we step only where we need to step. Every action and every minute in nature counts. To support our heartfelt intentions, we relied heavily on the learnings of others to help us plan and prioritize. We had a group of diverse experts to help us identify species, use the Bradley method, and prioritize where to work. We also began learning about Indigenous people's ideas about land stewardship and land healing. The Toronto Nature Stewards provided an overview of their stewardship program and shared their plant information template with us for adaptation to our needs. We relied on the Invasive Species Centre and the Ontario Invasive Species Council best practices and other reference material to guide our management actions. Like most small organizations, we are resource limited in some respects. So our management planning was tailored to the type of work we could do using manual management actions with volunteers and hand tools. This would allow us to better connect with the community, so sorry, to better connect the community with nature, not require significant funding to begin and create a manageable scope for successive years. Here's an idea of some of the list making and gathering of information and trying to make sense of it all. In the early stages, the task seemed too big, but our intentions guided us to what was possible and impactful. Here you can also get an idea of the complexity of the information about the area and the characteristics we noted as we prepared for the assessment stage. To help us make sense of all the information we had collected, the Friends of Second Marsh Plant Stewardship Subcommittee created a simple Microsoft Excel algorithm to weigh adaptive factors and provide guidance. Most of these factors are shown on the right and include expert opinion, location in or near high value habitats, size of colonies, whether manage manual management techniques existed and were low impact. And I want to clarify that low impact here means low impact to the environment, not poor effectiveness. Then the algorithm was used for each plant and assessed against our resource availability and basic management priorities. In this case, we are evaluating whether to manage woodland angelica with volunteers, and the algorithm is saying yes. Now this may seem easy, but we have 15 plants on our recommended management list, so the algorithm helped us be consistent while allowing us to compare across species and management units, and I'll demonstrate that in the next slide here. From the weighted numerical values for each plant, we then compared how each plant species ranked against each other. This gave us a comparative scale to gauge which management effort with volunteers would make the most impact. Volunteers here are, showing, are shown managing Woodland Angelica, which was ranked most important to manage with volunteers by our algorithm. We translated the algorithm recommendations and best management practices into an annual management calendar. It is focused on high priority habitats in McLaughlin Bay Wildlife Reserve, forest and wetland margin habitats. If resources were available, dominant introduced plant colonies and other locations were managed, especially if they were small or emerging. 
So I realized this is a bit of an eye chart and I'm sure it's really hard to read, but again, it summarizes and highlights the recommended top priority areas and species to be managed by whom and how. Here's an overview of the main management units and dominant introduced plant species managed in 2023. This will be our starting point for 2024 planning as we continue our plant stewardship activities in the McLaughlin Bay Wildlife Reserve. Our, sorry, our adaptive plan allows for adding or stopping management actions as we continue to map and monitor the area. In 2024, should resources be available, we hope to hire seasonal staff and to expand planning for additional restoration actions like planting and seeding preferred species. In 2023, Friends of Second Marsh volunteers contributed 366 volunteer hours, including 195 field work hours to manage nine plant species over 23 field action days. During those days at the marsh, we saw four different species at risk, including this baby snapping turtle. You may say that the reasons for plant stewardship are obvious, but feelings of fatigue and despair around action for the environment are real. And let's be honest, plant stewardship is a lot like gardening. It can be hard work, it can be uncomfortable, and it has risks. There are certainly other, more pleasant ways to spend a few hours out in nature. But Friends of Second Marsh made sure there was meaningful intent and achievable goals behind each activity, and that there was time to enjoy nature and each other's company too. Look at these faces. Their smiles tell the story. A regular group of volunteers often asked us at the end of activities, so are we going out again next week? We would tell them of the fire ants, the hot weather, the need to wear uncomfortable gear and risk of getting wet or needing to learn a new technique, but this only made them more excited. Somehow that sounded fun. We got great feedback on how this program resonated with our volunteers, and we made sure we recognized their contribution to Friends of Second Marsh at the end of the calendar year. So these are our, our key recommendations today. We suggest that plant stewardship programs use positive language, know and share heartfelt intent, plan for success and within capacity, leave time for enjoying nature and camaraderie, celebrate and be grateful, foster volunteer green fulfillment, and especially hope. Ask yourself, why is this person smiling? She is almost waist deep in the marsh, collecting flower and seed heads of flowering rush, but still she's having a great day out in nature. In fact, there were other volunteers on the shore wishing they too were waist deep in the marsh, but that day they were working in the shallows. Setting and expressing our heartfelt intentions in a positive way was critical to creating a plant stewardship program that connected and encouraged not only our, vol our, our volunteers, but us as well. We thank all of our volunteers and teachers. We could not have done this program without them. Thank you for your attention and thank you to the Invasive Species Center for not only allowing us to tell you about this important topic today, but for their financial support to manage common buckthorn at McLaughlin Bay Wildlife Reserve. We look forward to another season of meaningful plant stewardship with volunteer stewards and refining our program. We invite you to join us or at a minimum to drop by the area for a visit. It is a wonderful place to enjoy nature and reflect on your place within it. And now if there's time, I'm open for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Susan. And uh, you finished about a minute early, so we do have several minutes um, for questions. Um, I'll maybe just give us a second. I don't see anything in the uh, Q&A box yet. Um, just remember that if you do have any questions, uh, please put them there. Um, not seeing anything in the chat either. Um, I will maybe just add a personal anecdote that I am also from Oshawa. Um, we're both in Oshawa, we're the second marshes. Um, so yeah, can testify to it uh, being a really cool place and uh, glad to see this, this work being done um, in my home city. Um, 
We do have a question now, so I'll read that out. Uh, positive language, any sources to help in adjusting our language choices? Um, I think what was really inspired by um, attending the Invasive Species Council in Ontario Invasive, um, oh, sorry, Invasive Species Centre and Ontario Invasive uh, Plant Council um, conferences last year where there were some um, Indigenous people presenting about their thoughts on plant stewardship and how plants are their relatives, right? And it really made us think about um, how to better talk about what we were trying to do, because again, we we're trying to make this positive impact. So we really struggled with what could we, you know, propose because um, as in the last presentation, they talked about they use invasive alien uh, species as their terminology that's understood internationally. And we were challenged actually by our board that they didn't want, we started off with alien species actually, but then we said there's this whole thing about, you know, what belongs and what doesn't belong. Um, in that one slide, I reference um, a couple of um, indigenous um, resources. One is uh, Braiding Sweetgrass uh, by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And there's another one that was, I think she was a presenter at one of these conferences and I watched her video. She's a, I, I can't recall her name, but if you go back and eventually see this, I can dump it in the, um, the chat after. Um, she did a presentation where she talked about how um, out in BC, she was doing invasive species management and how she started, you know, looking at, um, you know, she was, she is an indigenous person and, she, but she was also, and she's a trained um, a scientist or, and then a professor. So, you know, the, I really took a lot of hint. We really took a lot of hints from there. And then we just thought, what, what words can we use that we can explain at least, you know, and then, and uh, again, we, we started with, we would say dominant introduced species and then in brackets have invasive, right? And then after we did that for a year, um, we stopped putting it in brackets at the end. And, and it's it's amazing to watch how changing the way you say things really makes like folks like these who come out to these events feel really good about what they're doing. Whereas I noticed when we would have folks out for invasive Phragmites management, they were hacking at the ground, like, you know, they, you know, hated the ground, you know, it was really, um, and, and invasive phragmites management or dominant introduced phragmites management is difficult, but they, I could see they were angry, you know, like it was their, even their way they, they felt about what they did, you know, and they felt like it was, um, it was hopeless, you know, like there was so much of it. Anyway, I'm not giving you very good references, but I don't, other than those two specific ones, but it really just, I think what was more important for us was to really look at what are we really, you know, trying to achieve. And if it's to improve the environment, make a positive impact, then we should make it, we want it to feel like it's a positive experience as well. Hopefully that's Great. not too much. Yeah, anything. no, thank <laughs> you for that perspective. I, I do think that's um, that's helpful. You had to kind of do the thinking yourself to some extent, yeah. right? Um, we actually, we had several more questions in the chat. I'm going to kind of try to combine some of them. Um, looks like someone is asking, could, could you elaborate more on the process you use to select and prioritize projects? And I think related to that, someone else asked, can you share some links and, and resources for that prioritization framework? Yeah, so the prioritization framework was um, is something that we created actually, and we are. I didn't talk about it too much about our next steps. We are we are looking to. Um, it, it leans heavily on the Bradley method, I would say. So where you look at uh, where are there small small isolated colonies? Where is your uh, most valuable rare sensitive habitats? Um, and whether uh, the, whether or not there is a management technique that suited the resources that we had. 
So basically I just, I created an Excel spreadsheet and everything was given a different weighted value. And you just sort of said, yes, no, you know, mo most of the colonies are small or some of the colonies are small, or there's only one colony kind of thing. You would sort of answer these questions and then you would get different weight or weighted values. And at the end, it added up all those numbers. And then that's why uh, Woodland Angelica, which is a small, it's, it's actually a fairly large area, but it's only in one part of the marsh. And it's fairly new, and we want to make sure that it doesn't get outside of that area. And it, it, because it's close to the marsh and it's in the forest habitats, it ranked high because it was um, in a sensitive, you know, rare habitat in our rare area. And it was also close to a trail. There were management techniques that we could do uh, manual actions. Um, we had an expert who highly recommended that we should go after it versus all the other ones. So that's why it's so emphasized in that chart that I showed you. Um, definitely are looking at a, in 2024, we're going to be working with another organization so that they can uh, do another test on the system, on, on the, the rating system. And what we're hoping to do is by the end of this management season, be ready to be able to create some kind of a, um, a tool that would be widely available for any small or any organization to use. Because that was really our biggest issue beyond you know, setting the intent. It was looking at the vast amount of work and the vast number of species to be managed and knowing where to start. Um, so that Susan, was, I think yeah. um, I'm going to have to wrap things yep. up there. Yep. Just want to keep to time, but that did kind of answer another question. Okay. Um, so that works well. Um, yeah, if you did want to um, check that Q&A box and if you're able to type an answer, if, if you'd like to, um, feel free to do that. Otherwise, um, someone from ISC will put your email in the chat. And if anyone does have follow-up um, questions uh, or questions we didn't get to get to, um, you can you can follow up with Susan. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah, and feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to be moving on to our final speaker of the session. Um, Lawrence Gunther should be here any moment. Hi, Lawrence. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So we... I will be sharing your screen. Lawrence is coming to us from Bluefish, Canada. And let me just get this up and running for us. Give me just one more second here. Just need to make it full screen. Okay, we have our title slide good to go. Um, so just prompt hmm. me when you want me to switch slides. All right, and when I when I, when you flip the slide and you see the title come up, just let me know. But uh, everyone, I'm Lawrence Gunther. I'm the uh, president and founder of Bluefish Canada. We're a charity. Uh, we were established and registered with the uh, Canada Revenue Agency in 2012. We're all about the future of fish and fishing. And uh, so, what has this got to do with fishing and invasive species? Well, yeah, there's a, we're finding out tons. There's tons to do with it. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Bluefish Canada, what we do, our mission, and uh, the work we've been doing with the Invasive Species Centre and youth across Canada through our various programs and uh, mentors, trainers, expert anglers, influencers to get the word out about what anglers can do to identify, prevent, and um, mitigate invasive species. So a little bit about Bluefish Canada first. We have a get ready for fishing program where we teach young people and their families, uh, youth of all backgrounds, abilities, identities. We're really into uh, sort of the diversity, equity and inclusion thing. I'm a totally blind person myself. I've been blind since age eight and uh, I love fishing. It's something that I'm pretty good at. It's, you know, it's all about the feel of the bite, right? So 
I really got into tournament fishing for uh, uh, quite a few years there. And I was doing about 15 tournaments a year and I was doing pretty good, but I realized this whole underwater world um, that was hidden away from most people, it, it was a, a world that I could visualize through my fishing rod, through information, through uh, First Nations knowledge, science, technology. And I and I, I got into scuba and I realized there was a ton of stuff going on down there. And we needed to really wake up because we were changing the underwater worlds in so many radical ways through invasive species. So we established a Bluefish Exploration Center. Well, that's going to open this July. And that's going to be where researchers and young people can get together and uh, young people can support the researchers of doing fisheries research around um, biodiversity, uh, shoreline uh, resilience, invasive species, and other sort of water quality issues, fish health issues. We uh, founded the Great Lakes Fish Health Network in 2017 with the Canadian Environmental Law Association and the Great Lakes Network, and we've been chairing that. And we just now started the uh, St. Lawrence uh, Fish Health Network. We have a bluefish newsletter. If you're interested in hearing what's going on about fish, water quality, fish habitat, uh, and other news, aquatic news from across Canada, you can register for that on the uh, bluefishcanada.ca website. It comes out every couple weeks and uh, it's not long enough. It's about 10, 12 pages, but uh, it starts with an editorial and people, um, people love it. We have over 5,000 registered uh, subscribers. We have a podcast that's been going since 2013. We've got over 400 episodes. We're interviewing people of uh, special interest to the underwater world, to fish, to fish health, to water quality. And um, it's it's the second uh, best fishing conservation podcast in the, in the world, so we're told. Uh, Quality-wise, we're very happy with it. Um, next slide, please. Mission. So really water quality is important to uh, to fish and fishing. You know, that's our name. We're about blue. We're about fish. Uh, fish are uh, made up of about 80% water. They get their oxygen from water. They, they live in water. They breathe water. They uh, absorb water. And, um, you know, it's just a big part of them. And, and they can't really get away from it. It's, it's who they are. It, it's where they live. Uh, they can't put on a mask. They can't seal themselves into uh, their home and uh, avoid water. So we're, it's up to us to make sure it's really a, a, a good quality for them, uh, supporting life. Habitat resilience is, is another big thing. We've lost, you know, 95% of the wetlands in southern Ontario. And uh, we're hardening shorelines. And now with uh, extreme weather, floods, storms, surges, uh, drought, um, we're having, you know, fires, we're having more impacts on, uh, on habitat, uh, ever increasing. Invasive species prevention is something we started learning about, you know, with the, uh, the introduction of the roundhead goby and, uh, in the great lakes. And, you know, for the longest time, we, we, we kept hearing about, you know, the ships coming into the great lakes from across the ocean, from around the world, dumping their ballast. Uh, introducing uh, zebra mussels, uh, spiny water fleas, uh, other plants and seeds and, and, and fish. You know, we've been talking about the Asian carp knocking at the door of the Mississippi, trying to get into the Great Lakes and Lake Michigan and the potential threat there of, of these uh, Asian carp coming in. And uh, it's always been this big issue, you know, these big vectors that we've been talking about as the problem for invasive species we're learning now that that's not the problem anymore but we'll get into that in a bit more fish health you know we we always think about fish health as our fish safe to eat you know it, with the fish consumption advisories that are produced by the Ontario government. So there's over 2,500 areas in Ontario where they test fish for different uh, toxic chemicals and determine who can eat how many fish. If you're over a certain age or if you're a youth, if you're a mother, a pregnant nursing mother, you know, they have all these different uh, guidelines and, um, and what that means for your health. But we don't talk much about the fish's health and, and the stress they can be under when things in their environment go sideways. And the big thing here is it's a one health relationship. If you want to, if you want to connect with nature, if you want to spend time in the outdoors, if you want to 
have that as part of your life, you know, you're taking something from that. You're taking a peace and tranquility. You're taking food for some people. It's really important as a, as a source of food for people with food insecurity, uh, for first nations, uh, friends, it's, it's part of their life. They've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years and, you know, it, to cut them off from that has been a huge injustice. So it, it you know, the whole idea there, if, if we get our health, if we depend on our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health from connecting with nature, we have to give back too. Because if it, the nature is not healthy, then we're not going to be healthy. So it's this circular um, connection we have with water and, and nature that uh, we need to look at as a, as a one health relationship. So, you know, it all comes down to the future of fish and fishing. Indigenous folks say that we have to think seven generations ahead. Everything we do, everything we're thinking about doing, what's this going to mean for the seventh generation from us, our great, great, great grandchildren. And we need to go forward while walking backwards. So we always see where we came from, the people we're leaving, the people we're connected to, our history, our connection, our mistakes. And never forget those, you know, looking over our shoulders to plot our course, but never forgetting where we came from. Next slide, please. Vectors. Yeah, vectors. So I've been working with the Invasive Species Center uh, uh, as the uh, Executive Director of Bluefish Canada and getting our volunteers and our organizations, our partners, our collaborators getting the word out about aquariums and ponds you know that's was seen as a vector now with with aquarium fish being released and uh, pond fish being released and and pond plants getting into the uh, uh, ecosystem you know we know those big head carp and silver carp and grass carp they were all put into ponds in the in the southern united states uh closed containment type uh, aquaculture ponds to to keep the water clean to keep the weed growth to a minimum so that the, the, the fish, the desirable fish in those ponds would uh, be healthy. And then when there were some major storms and some of those ponds flooded and connected with the Mississippi river, a lot of those fish got out. Now they make up over 90% of the biomass in the Mississippi uh, river. So that was a big mistake of ours. But again, it's, you know, these big events that we point to, but now the big, problem across Canada is most of you probably know it it's goldfish right there's so many small storm ponds and 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 uh, bays and, and many different lakes that are just turning a beautiful gold and when you look close it's goldfish and these are these are uh you know uh, the cousin of the common carp and they can get quite big six seven eight pounds uh, when they're in in the wild they they, they live in very stagnant water with very low oxygen levels. They root around, they stir up the sediment a lot, and they they really make that uh, water uh, really on, on his, inhospitable to other forms of life. So they're, they're very destructive in their own little ways, but they're super tough. The other thing we've found out now is live bait is, is a big vector. So, you know, a lot of anglers like to fish with, uh, with minnows, right? And uh, so, you know, Quebec, not so long ago, passed a rule saying you can't use minnows anymore. It, it, even if they're dead, you can't use them because they can carry disease. They can be themselves invasive. So if you're carrying, a, if you're buying some minnows at a, at a, or catching some and you put them in a bucket and you, you, you bring them to with you fishing the next day to another lake, and you catch a few fish and you think at the end of the day, well, I'll just re release these leftover minnows. You know, the fish get a free meal, no hooks attached, and you're doing them a favor. It, you're not doing them a favor. There's a good chance you could be introducing foreign species of minnows into that water body. Those minnows could have viruses that are being introduced into that water body as well. So this has been a big learning curve. You know, we, we've passed now laws in Ontario that the, the minnows you buy have to be uh, caught within the region where you're going to use them so that there's no cross-border movement of viruses. It's not as uh, restrictive as Quebec, but, you know, we might get there at some point if, uh, if these things keep happening. And, um, you know, we see that there's viruses out on in the West Coast and the Rocky Mountains of, that are being passed from uh, river to river. And uh, they can be quite destructive to the uh, wild fish population. Watercraft too, right? Now, it's not these giant ships anymore that are passing through uh, the Great Lakes and over oceans that our own kayaks and canoes 
and, uh, and, and pleasure boats and fishing boats and the trailers they're conveyed on and the trucks and, and cars and vans that move them from water body to water body, they can convey invasive species too. And just getting that uh, word out, get that message out to anglers has been a challenge, right? Because people, you know, they don't think of it as, a, you know, they don't see themselves as, as the conveyors of, of invasive species, but you know, a little plant hanging on to the axle of your uh, boat trailer that has some seed pods on it, or maybe some very small uh, zebra mussels uh, attached to that weed plant. And then you roll that out. And the next day you go to a different body of water and you roll your boat trailer into that uh, body of water. And voila, you've just, you know, conveyed um, a, a, an invasive species, or it could be your bilge water. It could be your water in your live well a lot of fishing boats have live wells sort of built-in aquariums with aerators they they pump the water into those tanks uh you carry your fish around if you're in a tournament and, and you, you bring your fish and show them get them weighed and you measured put them back in you let them go you know if some of those tanks and the pumps and the and the and the hoses that connect those pumps can still contain the water and, and they can contain eggs or a very small sort of life forms of invasive species so it's now it's the law in ontario that when you take your boat out of the water you have to check your trailer you have to make sure it's clean there's no hanging weeds on it you have to make sure your bilge is empty your uh, your water tanks your live wells are completely empty and you do that before you leave you don't do it when you get there in the morning you do it at the end of the day you leave all that stuff from that day behind where where you, where you found it and you take your boat away but it's even even it's even more challenging than that. Even waders, like rubber boots, it can get you know things can get caught into the grips of the rubber boots, and even the leather uppers of, of fishing waders can convey uh, viruses. So you know, in some areas, you have to wash your boots with uh, with bleach to make sure you're not conveying viruses and and seeds and things like that. So there's a lot of training, a lot of awareness that's being done with the angling community. You know, there's there just in Ontario alone, there's over 1.2 million people that buy fishing licenses every year. These are people that between the ages 18 and 65. If you're over 65, you don't need a fishing license. If you're under 18, you don't need one. If you have a you're a person with a disability in Ontario, you don't need a fishing license. So there's a lot of people that don't buy fishing licenses that uh, fish. A lot of people have cottages and they have fishing rods and they go fishing and they don't necessarily buy licenses either. There's an estimate that maybe 17 million people in Canada have fished, will fish, and know where their fishing rods are, and uh, and and consider themselves to be fisher people. So it 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 is a a, a very powerful potential um, way to move it and move invasive species. Now, just to be clear, this is not just speculation. You know, some of these, uh, a lot of anglers use apps now to record their catches. And one of the popular apps is called Fish Brain. It's got 13 million anglers who have registered for that app. So there, a scientist in the United States looked at the data that the uh, these apps collect on Fish Brain. And there's geospatial data. So there's GPS coordinates involved with that. And she's overlaid it with a, um, a series of, of the roadmaps in, in the United States. And, and she can tell from where they are when they turn on their app and where they go that these people leave the city and they go to lakes you know many are, are local lakes within a day's drive of the city and they fish and maybe a week later those same people drive you know a day uh, maybe three or four hours and go to a further destination to a, a beyond that and 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 then they go fishing in those bodies of water and she can see just by the movement of these, these these patterns of movement by the anglers with their with their vehicles and their boats, it it mimics exactly the spread of invasive species from one lake to the next to the next. And then people who live on those more outlying lakes outside the cities, they move into the deeper forest with their watercraft, and th then they convey the the invasive species even further into the wilderness. So you know we're seeing you know, the spread of gobies all across uh, Southern Ontario, zebra mussels being brought uh, into more and more bodies of water. It, it's no, it's, you know, it, 
cottagers who have uh, cottages are, are getting very upset and they want to close their public boat access, their boat ramps to their, to their lakes that they have their cottages on because they don't want to see those invasive species come into, into their lakes. So there's a lot of tension developing between the angling community, the cottage, uh, lake owner, uh, shoreline owner associations. It, it, you know, there's a lot more awareness has to happen because uh, you know, the disturbances and the problems that are evolving because of the transmittal of, of invasive species, just one, you know, every angler, if they carry just one a summer, that's millions of transferences every year. Lawrence, just letting you know, yeah. you've got about three and a half minutes left, including for questions. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm done. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, that's, that's, um, please feel free. Perfect. Okay. And I have it on the last slide there. I'm just going to thank you very much for your presentation. It was very engaging. Um, yeah. Just checking uh, the Q&A box here. Um, there was an initial question that I wanted you to answer, but I think you kind of did through your presentation. Um, and it was about your organization doing advocacy for boat washing, um, especially around the Great Lakes region. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like you are doing that. I don't know if you wanted yeah. to um, expand on that a bit, but uh, we do have other questions as well. Yeah, we do a lot. If you look on our website under the resources, we have stewardship tips for anglers or 10 tips. So we have a lot of those around uh, uh, invasive species and other things in terms of what anglers should know. If you want to fish sustainably, if you want to be making sure you're doing it the right way, we, our tips are come from expert anglers reviewed by first nations knowledge keepers and fact checked by scientists and help yourself download them all you want if you want to share them just just give us some credit for where they came from so we can pass that credit back to the the knowledge keepers where where it originates from it's bluefishcanada.ca great uh thank you um someone else is wondering where bluefish canada is located and do they offer presentations to local youth camps in the saint catharines area yeah, we're we're in uh, we're in Ottawa, but we travel throughout Southern Ontario. Uh, we have youth that we hire. We run our Get Ready for Fishing programs in the spring. It's a it's um it's a shore based dry land training. You know, once people are fishing, they just want to fish, right? So we we try to educate them around uh, fish identification, invasive species prevention, water quality testing, uh, fish handling best practices and selecting the right tackle, you know, lead free circle hooks, barbless, things like that. Okay. Give us a call. Yeah. Thank you. And then would you be able to share some details regarding the fish brain work? The Fresh Brain is one one app, and it's made by Sweden. We have some really good apps here in Canada. The one that for catching and tracking your catch, and for all that data being made available to researchers, but at the same time protecting your privacy so it doesn't give away your your favorite spots. It's called My Catch, and it's an organization in British Columbia called Anglers Atlas. And that, that's a free app. You can register for My Catch. And there's uh, many thousands, uh, 100,000 people on that right now. We're also um, supporting other apps like the uh, uh, Fish Health Tracker tool. Uh, that's from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, some other organizations. So that's a big one we're, we're supporting as well. And uh, we're really promoting the idea of using these apps but it's it's not easy, you know, to get people to use these things just for moral or ethical reasons. So we use a lot of um, competitions, peer recognition, uh, rewards, prizes, things like that, just to get people used to using them. And we find younger people, they're more comfortable with technology anyway, so it, it's a easier fit. And so we do a lot of work with young people. It's, uh, they're more, you know, they're they're growing up listening about environmental issues and it's important to them. Absolutely. Okay. Um, perfect timing. We are at time now. Um, Lawrence, want to uh, thank you so much um, for closing off our uh, our first day of the forum, but I will um, pass it off to uh, Madison to kind of formally send us off. Thanks, Em, and thank you to all our speakers and attendees today. We hope you enjoy the first day of the forum. If you miss any of the sessions, we'll have them all recorded and posted over at our YouTube channel with speaker permissions. Uh, we hope to see you back tomorrow at 8.45 a.m. Eastern time to hear about um, lots of other invasive species issues, starting with aquatic invasives tomorrow. 
Uh, we have another great lineup of speakers all day tomorrow. So thank you again so much and have a great night.